The pursuit of happiness is one of humanity's ultimate goals. And an answer to the age-old question, how can I be happier, that's often focused on, is to increase the amount of material wealth that you have in your life. Things like income or square footage, to have more. This idea is embraced by economists and policymakers, and the dogma is so inset in our society that many people spend their entire lives competing to have more wealth. But more is not always better. In fact, the paradox of this approach is that often increased wealth isn't even correlated with increased happiness. Sometimes, in the case of some massive lottery winners, for example, increased wealth actually leads to decreased happiness. The truth is, humans are just pretty bad at making choices about how to be happy. As a behavioral economist, one of the things that I'm interested in is how to study those times when we predictably get it wrong, and at the same time, have a research paradigm to understand how we humans can make better choices. Uh, this empirical research on how to increase the positive experiences and the quality of those experiences that we have in our lives is called hedonomics, and that's what I'd like to talk about today. So, if economic studies how to maximize wealth with limited resources, hedonomic studies how to maximize happiness with limited wealth. Uh, let's start with an example of traditional economics. So, in traditional economics, a gain in wealth means an increase in happiness, and a loss of wealth means a decrease in happiness. These gains and losses affect happiness in the same way, no matter what level of wealth you started with, or how often the gains and losses happen. In fact, in the standard model of economics, humans are even good at making decisions. Uh, that probably should have been a cue when they got it wrong. Uh, when we make a decision about happiness in standard economics, we always get it right. And this is partially because of what economists call completeness and transitivity. Two assumptions that when a choice is in front of us, we have all the options and we can weigh them perfectly. Of course, real life doesn't work like this. Uh, and in one of the things that behavioral economists have been able to prove is that when it comes to happiness, everything is relative. So this is what gains and losses, how they actually affect happiness. The first thing I'd like to point out is the center of the graph, where the crosshairs meet. We call this the reference point. And every gain and loss is thought of relative to this reference point. And in our personal experience, a gains and losses are dependent on our personal reference point. This is usually based on what we call the status quo. So our current level of wealth, or health, or job, job satisfaction. Uh, and of course, you can imagine different people have very different status quos and different reference points. Uh, Mitt Romney has a significantly different reference point than I do, and I have a significantly different reference point than someone living in Bangladesh. Um, and at the same time, the three of us would experience gains very differently. So a $100 gain for me is pretty significant. But for Mitt Romney, who makes $100 approximately every two and a half minutes, probably wouldn't tip the happiness scale at all. Um, the second thing to point out on this graph is that losses are far more intense than gains. Uh, this is what psychologists call loss aversion, and for many of us, it's intuitive. So think about buying a new necklace, a $200 necklace, that's on sale for $100. If we frame this in terms of a savings of $100, it feels much better than framing it as an expenditure of $100. That's loss aversion. The third part of the graph that's worth pointing out is the slope of the blue line. So if we start at the reference point and we have a big gain, we move up the line, and any further gains are going to be less intense because the slope levels off. The same thing happens for losses. This curve is what we call prospect theory, and Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in 2002 for developing this theory. Okay, so now that we know how gains and losses, the experience of these, affect our happiness, let me give you a few strategies for increasing happiness or decreasing sadness when more than one thing are going to happen at the same time. So let's say you know you're going to have two negative events. The best strategy would be to try and experience those in close proximity because the second event will be less intense 
if it comes after the first. And I've had personal experience with this one. Um, a few years ago, I went on a vacation with a woman in Europe. It was supposed to be a two-week vacation. We were dating. And on day two, she dumped me. So, yeah. so I decided to uh, buy a plane ticket home, which, as you know, on short notice, they're very expensive. But at this time, sort of reeling from being dumped, the uh, price didn't bother me at all. <laughs> uh, strategy number two, if you're going to experience two gains, uh, two happy events, you should try and experience them apart. Uh, and here's an interesting non-intuitive example of that, uh, which comes to dating. So normally when we go out on a date, we'll take somebody out for dinner and then try and go home for drinks afterwards. Uh, well, science would say that you should skip dinner altogether and just have drinks because they'll be much better. Um, to be clear, this is not why I got dumped in Europe. Uh, uh, prospect theory also helps explain something called the Easterlin paradox, and perhaps you've heard of this one that when uh, absolute income increases across generations, uh, self-reported happiness does not. And that's because the reference point across generations is shifting. Uh, in, in this graph, what I'm showing is absolute income on the bottom, uh, and the high and low income families in a poor society, and high and low income families in the rich society. The important part is that the low income families in the rich society actually make more money than the high-income families in the poor society, but they're less happy. That's because the, the status quo and the reference points for each society is different. Uh, interestingly, behavioral economists have been able to show that not all uh, experiences fit this relativistic rule of prospect theory. Um, it turns out that the things that do fit tend to be the things that need to be compared to something else. So things like the amount of money that you have, or how fancy your car is, or you know, how many shoes you have in your closet. Um, the really interesting thing is the ones that don't fit this pattern. They have an absolute pattern. So no matter where you live or what your status quo is, they will always make you happy or always make you sad. And more of them tends to be better if it's a good thing, or fewer of them tends to be better if it's a bad thing. So let me give you some examples. The temperature in a room. Uh, cold temperature will always make you unhappy, and being cold again and again doesn't make it any better. Um, good food when hungry, or drink when thirsty. Um, grandma's apple pie is always delicious, even when you're coming back for seconds. Uh, or, and there's a whole list. Let's say things like stress, the amount of sleep that you get, companionship, loneliness, and even the number of orgasms that you have every day, these are all inherently valuable things. And their curve looks like this. So the reason they're different is because we can evaluate them without having to compare them to something else. So a simple rule of thumb to be happier is, one, if you can evaluate an experience without having to compare it to something else, and two, it makes you happy, you should try and experience it as often and as fully as possible. So now we understand how uh, most of the things that we experience are relative and they shift with our status quo. I have other bad news. Most of the things that we experience also diminish in happiness over time. Uh, we call this hedonic adaptation. Uh, and it happens for many reasons. Some are physiological, some are because our intention shifts away, or sometimes it's just because we can rationalize away a feeling. Uh, for example, after a bad breakup, I'm sure you've heard somebody say, you know, she didn't love me anyways. Um, most experiences look like this over time. You have a peak of happiness during initial consumption, and then as you consume again and again and again, the happiness goes down over time. So this could be buying a brand new car or a piece of art, and then over time, it gives you less pleasure. Well, much like uh, prospect theory, where we found some things that don't fit the norm. Uh, behavioral economists have also found things that don't fit the norm of hedonic adaptation. Um, and these things tend to be things that are unexpected. Uh, so an example, my favorite example, are things like the weather. You never know if next week is going to be raining or not. And I know when we have a beautiful October day, uh, my grandfather never gets tired of telling me how wonderful it is. Uh, the curves of these unexpected things look more like this where you still get an initial peak at consumption, but over time, uh, the happiness that you get from it, or the sadness, if it's something that's a negative feeling, doesn't go away. Um, 
Interestingly, these unexpected things also tend to be these inherently valuable things because you never know when your next deli delicious meal is going to be and you don't usually know how your next date is going to go. Uh, as a neuroscientist by training, I'd be remiss now not to talk a little bit about the neuroscience of consumption. Um, neuroscience has only played a very new role in, in understanding economic decision making, but a few of the things that we found are really important with respect to hedonomics. So one thing I'd like to talk about today is what we call the pain of pain. This is when you spend money and it actually sort of feels like it hurts. Uh, uh, th and this isn't the same thing as opportunity cost. This is actually a, non, uh, you know, a pain that you wouldn't expect simply from parting with your money. It's a theory that we've had in behavioral economics, and neuroscience has been able to prove that this exists. So the studies that uh, showed this for the first time were done in the lab I currently work in. Uh, and what they did is they had people come into the lab and do a shopping experiment, where first they showed them the picture of the item that they might be able to buy, then the price, and then they had them make a yes or no choice of whether they'd like to buy the item. And unsurprisingly, when they saw the, uh, the product that was available, the reward system lit up in the brain. It's the same thing as uh, sex or music. The reward system for, I might get to buy something. Uh, the interesting part was when they saw the price. In this case, uh, an area of the brain called the insular cortex lit up. And this part of the brain is associated with anticipation of disgust or pain. So the really interesting thing was it was correlated directly with the difference in price between what they saw on the screen and what they self-reported after the experiment to be a fair price for the object. So high prices actually elicited a feeling of pain in the brain that we could measure. Uh, this is why we think when somebody says, that price is disgusting, they actually are feeling it. It's not just a saying. Uh, so this is what we call pain of pain. And uh, it means that there's an, always going to be an interesting trade-off between hedonic and economic efficiency. So how happy you can be based on what economists would like you to be doing. Um, and the key to being happier when you're buying things is to try and reduce the salience of that pain point. So a beautiful example of that is the all-inclusive vacation. When you pay in advance and then you go on vacation and you have as many free drinks as you want, you aren't thinking at all about the cost, you're just enjoying yourself. Uh, other examples on how to be happier when you're buying things would be to use a gift card instead of cash, to have a flat rate phone plan or a prefix menu. Now, economic efficiency would argue the exact opposite, that you should uh, pay afterwards in cash, that you should have an a la carte menu or the pay-as-you-go fo phone plan. So there's this great conflict between how to be happy and how to be economically smart. My favorite example of this is what we call the credit card effect. So recently I had people come into the lab to shop on an online store. There is about 200,000 things to buy, lots of options, uh, and MIT gave some great discounts for people, so it, they had you know, reasons to purchase things. But the, uh, the trick to the store was that half the items were available in cash and half the items were available in credit. What we saw was that for expensive items, people were significantly less likely to buy something in cash. But with credit, there was no such thing. In fact, you're almost exactly as likely to buy something that was expensive as you were something that was cheap when you were using your credit card. In theory, this is a really good thing. It means that you can buy something you want and not have that moral tax of having to pay for it. Um, of course, economic efficiency says it might be a problem because people were also two times as likely to purchase something with their credit card as they were with uh, their cash. So in closing, things like prospect theory, hedonic adaptation, and the pain of pain all have important social implications for policymakers. And being a bit of a policy wonk myself, I'd like to lay those out today. So we should try and invest in things that are inherently valuable if we want to increase the happiness of future generations. That means investing in things like less smog in cities, better public transportation, um, the ability to have a shorter work week so that you can spend more time with your friends and family 
and at the same time have less stress at work. Uh, and at the same time to reduce pain of pain, uh, governments should be investing in public goods for things that we need, things like healthcare, because it'll make the payment less salient and people will be much more likely to use it. For our personal lives, we can think of it the same way. We should stop trying to value things that are directly comparable to be able to be happy about them. Things like money, or the next art piece that you have in your house, or the you know, number of cars that you have. And instead, concentrate on those inherently valuable things. The size of your fiance's diamond ring is never going to make her as happy as holding hands in the park, or spending a few extra minutes in bed in the morning. Um, so I'll end with a question, uh, something that I, I love from behavioral economics. Uh, if you had to make the choice between having a big house with a long commute, or a small apartment in the city with a short walking commute, which one's going to make you happier? So because the house is static and doesn't change, but your commute, you never know how it's going to be, and usually they suck. In hedonomics terms, the small apartment and short commute are going to win out every time. Thank you very much.